Hi, I'm John Stobart. We're in the most picturesque part of England, right at the rocky coast of Cornwall, where the fields come down to little coves and there are many fishing villages and tons of subjects for the artist. Let's go and see what we can find in these coves and see if there's something nice to paint. Here we are in Newlyn, the early centre of outdoor painting in England. And who should we find here but my friend Bert Wright, who I'm hoping will come and join us for a painting trip today. Bert. Hi, John. Great to see you. Good yeah. to see you. I see. Oh, look what you're up to. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, this is one of the subjects which in the 1830s was still being painted by the outdoor painters. Absolutely. Well, we're going to have a nice day today and we're going to have a good painting session. Great. It's a great place, nice to be back. Fabulous. Well, Bert, we've got a blustery day here, haven't we? We sure have. And uh, the, the main thing that is in front of us is basically a triangle. And I think it would be a very easy thing for a beginner to attempt. There's nothing really complicated about it. I've been thinking that maybe I don't want that island with the abbey on top. I don't want that to be isolated in a pool of sea, I think I'd like to bring the shore in the, in the bottom edge with a little cluster of houses on the right. And I think that might just balance out the, uh, the triangle. And I'm just going to try that before I decide definitely whether I'm going to do it. OK. Well, this is always the dilemma of uh, whether you use a little bit of artist license to achieve a painting, or whether, when you're painting an actual subject, uh, you've got to keep it within the bounds of uh, recognition so that you don't move things around too much so that people uh, can't recognize the subject you're going to paint. Absolutely. But I agree that uh, compositionally we don't want this island just floating in the middle of uh, the sea. Right. Okay, well we've got quite a breezy morning here and uh, as you can see the eel is going to be rocking around somewhat but that's no problem. I'm painting watercolour this morning and I've always used this rig for many years which I designed myself. It's on a basic video tripod and the fixing at the back is the same that you would get on a video camera. And this holds the paper on all four sides which is very important on a day like this otherwise it's going to be flipping all over the place. The other reason for this is that for those of you who know about watercolour painting I don't need to stretch the paper because this will hold all four sides flat. The palette I'm using is one I've used for many years designed by an English fellow but this is good in that it holds big puddles of water. I find a lot of people try to paint watercolours with insufficient water. And when you do that, you get a very dry, uh, insipid looking painting. When you're painting a watercolour, you need plenty of water on it, plenty of colour to get the real lively effects that you need. The paper I'm using is French. It's Arche watercolour paper, heavy weight, 300 pounds weight. Can be seen to be a little expensive at around sort of uh, $8 a sheet but nevertheless, uh, it pays off. I always believe in using good materials, good brushes, good paints. Always use artist quality water paints. The reason for that is, uh, again, little expensive, but they will never, ever fade. Whenever situation they're in, I've got paintings now, been on people's walls for about 40 years, and there's no fading at all. Use a lesser quality paint, like a student's quality, and you tend to get some fading, maybe over a couple of years, but it can be very irritating. So I'm just about ready to roll now. What I'm going to do is just use this watercolour brush, uh, which is a fairly big one, but it's got a good point on it. That's a, again, I was talking about a good brush, you, a good watercolour brush should always hold. You're drawing in first, A book. good point. So I'm just getting a compositional layout first. Because um, what I want to do is complement this with quite a good sky. Now, I'm measuring the height of the water 
at arm's length. This is the only way that you can do this. You put your arm's length out, and I'm measuring the height of the water, the beach in the far distance to the foreground, and now I'm going to see how many times it goes into the composition. That height will be one, two, three, four, and about four and a half. So I've got a measure now on my canvas. Now it's one measure. Uh, one, and one, two, three, four, and a bit. So I have to go up, and I think I will go to about there. I've got to avoid that horizon line being right halfway. I want it to be just a little bit below halfway. Because I want to put a nice sky in this. I think this sky will make a nicer. So there we are. I'm about set. I may move it down or I may leave it where it is. It's almost low tide, I would think. It can't be more than uh, probably about an hour or two, wouldn't you think, But between the time you can go over to the abbey and... Uh... That's right, I think it's uh, at the most two to three hours. But apart from the wind, the light today is absolutely perfect. Uh, we're getting good sh cloud shadows. And of course, when we look at things like this, you've got to decide fairly early on where you're going to place things like cloud shadows because yeah. as you paint they'll be moving all the time so uh, the one that looks really good establish that and stay with it same is going to be true of the sky the sky is going to move quite a lot today whilst we're painting but the thing to do is to actually establish a part of the sky which may not be in your direct line of view but which actually fits your composition and then use that in the painting because sometimes the sky that's right in front of you doesn't work compositionally. We're working fairly differently in that John, as you probably understand the difference with an oil paint is, he's putting in his solid block colors first of all, uh, which then he will overpaint. In other words, he's working from dark to light. Uh, I'm working totally differently uh, in that I've got to use the white of the paper to pull through the colors to get my effect. So I'm working from light to dark. And in my case, what I have to do is, first of all, get the main composition using a simple little wash drawing, just to get that. But at this stage, I don't want to block in any color at all. If I do that, I'm stuck. Because one thing with a watercolor, it's a one-shot medium. You can't actually color, when the color's on there, you can't alter it, you can't change it. Uh, so you've got to be pretty careful uh, the amount of colour you're putting on initially. If you put too much and you try and overpaint, you're just going to end up with a real muddy painting. John's painting the foreground first. Uh, generally speaking, it's better in the watercolour to lay your sky in first. The reason for that is that that has got to dry before you can paint the rest of the painting, or at least it's got to be touch dry. If you try and paint the sky on top of the um, foreground, then it will bleed into the sky. No, I like the way the uh I call it a castle. It looks like a ca castle more than an abbey. It looks terrific, doesn't it? Uh, I want that to be in the light and the distance to be in the shadow. I think that'll create a terrific effect. I'm going to put in a sky at the moment, uh, which is not the sky that's in front of me, but I've been looking to the left whilst I've been painting, and there's a good sky there, which I think will suit this. And what I've got to do is work out the tonal values of this, because uh, this morning the light is reading from left to right, which means you've got a strong left-hand light on all the buildings and cast shadows on the right. But I've got to get sufficient depth of tone in the sky to make that building stand out. Also, I don't want a sky which is going to be horizontal because basically we've got a horizontal composition here. So I'm putting a sky which has got a good bank of cloud on the left. and will help to lead in the sky into the main subject which is here and I've deliberately pasted it off center right to the left of the sheet because if you've got a good center of interest like this try not to paste it right in the middle of the painting uh, a it's really not the right thing to do and uh, b you'll find that um, you'll have problems compositionally making the eye lead into it 
Um, the whole thing with a composition, if you can, is work it in advance so that you get your subject matter quite naturally. Don't do it in a forced manner, but quite naturally taking the eye into the main area of interest. I'm redrawing a little mountain. I'm redrawing my triangle higher up on the canvas because I've decided that the horizon should be slightly higher. I don't want it to go too high though because it'll lose the possibility of a nice sky. And I always like to have a nice sky. There we are. So I'm drawing it in by washing off what I had before. And now this looks to me to be the perfect shape because I now will definitely put the foreground in. There's lots of space for that. Uh, there's the causeway going across. The little farm buildings or whatever buildings they are in the right hand corner, I'm going to bring about uh, 200 yards left. The sky quite often gets a little touch darker near the horizon and also it will help me just to pull out this building when I come to paint it. Now I can't paint that at the moment because it's pretty obvious to see that sky is soaking wet. But what you do is try and help that situation by the bottom edge, just taking a piece of kitchen paper or whatever and just soaking up the bottom edge. Again, with watercolour, you need to get a... Don't paint it too flat. Um, a lot of the texture in watercolour, as you can see here, I hope the camera may pick it up, is you use pigments, which actually um, contrast with each other. You use an earth pigment, in this case it's a burnt sienna, and then you use another pigment, which is raw sienna. And when these two hit the paper, they'll form a textured surface. You'll get little specks of blue coming through the warm browns, and that creates a very nice sort of warm textured effect on the paper. To do that, you need a fairly granulated paper. This is a rough surface paper that, that will pick up those granulations. OK, well, I'm just adding another blue to this palette. Sounds a bit crazy, but a lot of people tend to think blue is blue, and blue is not blue. I mean, there's many different types of blue. I've got three types of blue here. Uh, again, for those of you who paint, one is French ultramarine, one is cobalt blue, and the other is cerulean blue. Uh, they're quite different in nature. Um, the cerulean blue, by the way, is uh, not exactly opaque, but it's one of the most opaque of watercolours. Uh, but it's very useful for this hazy effect we've got behind uh, St Michael's Mount. Uh, the thing here is to actually get uh, perspective not only in drawing, but also in depth. So that haze we've got in the background with the light on the little towns, uh, we need to achieve that, but not actually to dominate the whole painting. That's definitely got to be the background. Um, a lot of people, when they first start painting, buy a box of colours with like 58 colours in it. <laughs> well, generally speaking, that's a good deal for the paint manufacturer and he's delighted. But uh, for like us, um, I'm afraid he'd be out of money if it was... Because uh, most artists use, generally speaking, around between five and eight colours. Some artists I know even use only three colours. And it's amazing what you can do with three colours, if you know, you know how to mix them and so on. Okay, well I'm in the next stage of just laying in an indication of those hills in the background. Um, and again, we don't have this sort of detail, this is just an impression. Uh, again, some people make a mistake of trying to actually paint trees and houses and all the rest of it. I mean, I know they're there, but what you're doing is getting little flicks of light and light and shade, so that when you look at it from a distance, the eye is actually saying, I know what that is. It's a little group of houses in the sunlight in the distance with some trees. But you're not actually painting precisely that. Because of the wind, um, 
it's impossible to keep the hands still to do very detailed things. So it's going to be a touch and go. Here comes the cloud shadow right over our subject, which I wasn't expecting to happen. Uh, it'll be touch and go as to whether we can get exactly the effects we want. I have to work in sort of phases. In other words, this has now got to dry before I can get into the building proper. So what I may do is actually switch down onto the water and leave this right till the last. Um, that would be good anyway, because I can catch the light then just the way I want it. What I'm going to have to do is paint this stretch of water here, which is a, a shame really, but I can't paint the water into the buildings. So I've got to paint the buildings into the water. Again, I'm putting an under color here. Um, never paint a straight blue if you can help it. Uh, there isn't such a thing as a plain blue in nature. There's always an underlying color. And yeah, I'm using a slight wash of yellow ochre raw sienna. Right, well what we're doing now between gusts and trying to hold it down easy still. Just got a little bit of detail in these buildings. Like John, I don't want to put too much in. But um, the light and shade effect on this is quite great. Um, running down the right hand side of the island is a group of trees, uh, which almost looks like a Mediterranean situation. And I think, I can't remember, but I seem to remember the last time we were on there, there were actually only two cypress trees on the island. Um, one thing about the general um, planting around here is that you do get some Mediterranean type plants in that uh, this bit of the coast is the first bit of coast that's hit by the Gulf Stream uh, after it's left the American shores. So the water is never really that cold. And it comes up here and then it continues right up the west coast of England. So across the bay there in Panzans, for instance, uh, unbelievably, they do have palm trees. So these trees, which I say, I think some of them are cypress trees, uh, silhouetted against the town in the background, which is Penzance over there, just gives you that nice contrast and that produces a real depth into the painting. Two ways to achieve depth in a painting is obviously by the, getting the perspective right in the drawing in the first place. And the second is by getting your tonal values right in the colour you're using, the depth of colour you're using. So the tones, you get that level of contrast, uh, which I've got here, between the background and the foreground. Yep. This is really a spectacular subject but as you see it's really basically a triangle in horizontal stripes and uh, to keep it very simple um, the simpler that you can keep a subject like this the better it'll look really and I think uh, with the wind and everything we have been able to do a very simple job on it this is a little group of cottages, which um, are occupied by the people who work in the abbey and the other buildings on the island, um, which means that they don't have to keep scurrying across this causeway every time they go to work. When you paint a building, that's all you need to do to actually indicate it at this stage. Of course, where he goes on, you've got a blob of shadow along there. And then I'll just indicate by a few strokes that the brushway is going to continue out onto the mainland. There we go. Again, when you're painting, try not to actually weigh the brush on the paper. Keep your hand 
balance so that you're just flicking the brush onto the pavement. Well, the wind's still going and the sun's still shining and everything's looking good. There's a nice little town off to our right. That's, that's Mara Zion, isn't it? It is. Um, typical Cornish town, very narrow streets. But it's... Um, that's the main town that leads on to here, where the causeway runs out. But at the moment, it's got a lovely burst of sunlight on it with these dark shadows in the background. Right, well, whilst I've been concentrating on painting these buildings here, over here on the right-hand side, the tide has been going further out, and as we explained earlier, we're now talking like a 20-foot tide drop. So there's pieces of land becoming um, above the water line that weren't there when we first started the painting. And I like the look of them because I can do some nice sort of drag brush effects here. This again, you can do if you've got a, a fairly rook coarse paper, just use the side of the brush and flick it. And you'll see the way that comes out in a minute. Because these are nice little textures. And here, I'll just indicate the top of it as the, a cottage. Just sticking above its roof is something like that. I'll just block it in roughly like that with its chimney there. Just give me a little bit of foreground interest down here. I don't want to carry that, I just want the water here. But this will just show these little shoals of rock coming in here. And again, this is um, really using a semi-dry brush technique. And in America, of course, the fellow who was the real exponent of dry brushwork is Andrew Wyeth, who nearly all of his paintings were dry brush. This is darned easel will keep still, we can get something better, but anyway. This is it, you're dragging the side of the brush and then flicking the point all the time to get this impression of these rocks just poking through the water here. You can see what I've done now. I've got a, a tonal composition here which is giving weight in that corner, balancing the weight of the main painting over here. And also what I've done here is put a sky which again leads you into that. So, as we were saying earlier, think through right from the beginning how you're going to compose these things. I love the way the, the abbey is clinging to that cliff and there's kind of a curve coming down here like this. I wanted to get that curve right. That curve is the sort of going up like that and this goes round there. That pathway comes round. All those things are, can be adjusted in this final. There we are. I think um, I would like to do a little more work in the distance here, but with the conditions at bay at the moment, I think we'll call it a day. I'm just going to put a little bit of touch in the distance with the building there. It's just going to pick that out like that. There we are, I think that's it. You did a good job. Yep, that's interesting. We painted very similar compositions. Uh, sometimes we don't do that, do we? We both got it, really, I think. Yep, Isn't definitely, right? yeah. definitely. Well, I tell you what, I mean, apart from the else, you're frozen, I'm frozen. I think a good old Cornish pasty is what we <laughs> really need. Yeah? Why not? The last time we did this, it was fish and chips, but this time it'll be Cornish pasties. A Cornish pasty it'll be. Great. Good okay. idea. <laughs> <Very> good. <laughs> really enjoyed it, John. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, we've come to the end of our Cornwall visit. I hope you'll join us again on Worldscape. Let John Stobart show you the basics of painting in simplifying outdoor painting 
This instructional video, never before seen on television, is available for $29.45, including shipping and handling. To order with a credit card, call 1-800-839-1991 or send your check to CPTV Stobart, P.O. Box 82, Hopkinton, Massachusetts, 01748.